which players have the best vintage basketball cards you want to get. Well, we're going to talk about that now. The Dandy Dozen is back. Happy hobby. I'm David Gunst. Today we're getting back into the Dandy Dozen. These are the 12 best cards from a certain sport in a certain era. Now we've already done the Dandy Dozen baseball. We've done the vintage, the modern, we've done the millennials. We also did the Dandy Dozen NFL. We looked at the best vintage football players and cards you want to get, the best modern ones, and then the best millennials ones. The millennials, for both, you can understand that means the best most recent, the past 20 years, basically. Uh, best players, cards you want to get from those eras. Now we're turning to the NBA. The best vintage basketball players cards you want to get. Now, let me, let me, this is not the best rookie cards. This is not a rookie card listing. These are the 12 best players from the vintage NBA era, which in my case, we're talking about 1979 and earlier. That's vintage basketball as far as I'm concerned. Who are the best players? Who's any card? It doesn't have to be a, a, a rookie card. Which players whose cards you just want to get? And the way I collect is I get a great player's card and either I eventually get a better grade of that card or I get an earlier version card of that player. Today, pre-1980 vintage basketball cards. Now, let me first say there's a few players that aren't going to be on this list because there's not many cards for them. Obviously, Bill Russell, there's like three cards of his you can collect. If you have a Bill Russell card, that's a good thing. You don't need me to say, go get Bill Russell cards. There's only three main cards that he's ever had. So obviously those are pretty good. You don't need me to tell you that. All right, so let's get into the list. We talked about Bill Russell. Let's talk about his counterpart in the NBA, Wilt Chamberlain. These guys battled back and forth uh, off and on for championships for years. Bill Russell usually won all of them pretty much. I mean, uh, uh, But Will Chamberlain, one of the all-time greatest NBA centers, he partially changed the game, uh, scored 100 points in a game. Here's the thing. What's cool about Will Chamberlain from a collecting standpoint is when he came on, he came later than Bill, uh, Bill Russell. He came later on, and so that means – his cards, there's more cards when cards were being manufactured. So when we're talking about the NBA, there weren't a lot of cards manufactured before 1969. 1969, Tops really started producing them year after year after year. So that's really like the genesis of what we know today as the year after year cards that are produced. So before 1969, though, there was 1948 Bowman. There was 1957 Tops. And then 1961 Fleer. The, that's all that was before 1969, those three seasons. So, what that means is there's a lot of players whose rookie cards came from those sets. In a lot of cases, uh, there's 1969 cards that are like the second year players' cards, but really because he had a rookie card in 1961 Fleer, that 1969 card is his second card, but it's like his ninth or tenth it's 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 crazy to think about how that works out but from a collector standpoint wilt chamberlain came along a little later which means he has cards from 1969 all the way through 1974 tops so that's a big deal now his rookie card comes in the 1961 fleer set bill russell's rookie card was the previous one the 1957 top set but wilt chamberlain like i said the fact that he came along when he did that 61 Fleer, that's going to be a tough one for you to get. The 1969 Tallboy card, that's going to be a tough one to get. But you can get some of his early 70s cards like 1973, 1974 at decent prices. And then that gets you into the Wilt Chamberlain market. Does that make sense? I also want to mention, did you know that Wilt Chamberlain's nickname, Wilt is still his one nickname, but he was also called the nickname The Big Dipper. And I'd always heard that. I just thought because it meant he was massive and he was huge, like, constellation in the sky he was called the big dipper because every time he walked into a room he had to dip his head down not to hit the door jam at the top that kind of makes sense right all right so after wilt chamberlain who's our number one 
most collectible player in the Dandy Dozen Vintage Era list for NBA cards. Number two, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. We talk about centers aren't really collectible, but here we got the first two guys we talk about are centers, and they're both Lakers centers even. That's even interesting. So Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he changed his name. It was originally, obviously, his birth name. It was Lou Alcindor. He played for UCLA, won three consecutive national titles with John Wooden's UCLA Bruins. Only three, though, because he couldn't get a fourth because he was a freshman and they didn't allow freshmen to play in college, uh, in regular college basketball back then. So eventually, obviously, that would change. But three national titles, and then he gets drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks. His rookie card is the 1969 Cowboy. That's a tough one to get. You're going to have a tough time trying to track that one down at a cheap price. It's probably not going to happen. But he plays all the way through into the late 80s, so you can find some decent cards of his. Now, we talked about those breaks in cards from the the uh, from 48 to 1957 to 1961 to 1969. Well, there's also a break after the 1981 season through the 1986 season, so or 1986 year. So what that means is there's going to be a handful of years that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would have had cards produced, but those cards there weren't any cards produced for those uh, five or six years. So if you get some, you can get some pretty cheap in the late 70s. It's actually pretty cheap. Unfortunately, Tops did not manufacture really cool-looking cards in the 70s. In the early 70s, there's a couple, but the late 70s, they're, they're not they're not some great ones. They're kind of anyways. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, pretty awesome. Here's a little-known trivia fact for you. In March of 1969, the Milwaukee Bucks and the Phoenix Suns had to have a coin flip, a coin toss, to determine who would get the number one pick for that draft. And at that time, it was obvious that Lou Alcindor was going to be the number one pick. So the NBA did the coin toss. You'll never guess who won. It was the Milwaukee Bucks. They obviously won the coin toss. But... Could you imagine if Lou Alcindor was on the Phoenix Suns instead of the Milwaukee Bucks? Now, he went to the Milwaukee Bucks. They had Oscar Robertson, uh, and he ended up winning a title with the Bucks before moving on and playing for the Lakers. But if he went to the Phoenix Suns, do they win a title? That's interesting. I don't know. That's a tough one. All right, number three on our dandy dozen basketball list is not a center. Surprise. It's Julius Irving with the Philadelphia 76ers. He also played with the Virginia Squires and the the New York Nets, Dr. J. Now, don't call him Mr. J because he didn't go to 16 years of basketball medical school for you to call him Mr. J. The doctor. Dr. J. Evil, you have a little update. Sorry! Uh, won three professional basketball titles. Uh, went with the 76ers. Him and Moses Malone teamed up in the 80s for a title. Uh, won some slam dunk contests, including the very first slam dunk contest ever in 1976. Stay tuned to the end of this video because I'm going to give you three interesting Dr. J nuggets I think you'll think were interesting. All right, move on to number four, Jerry West. Now, L.A. Lakers legend, obviously, uh, teamed up with Wilt Chamberlain for a title. But the problem was, like I said, with Wilt, he came up during the time when the Celtics were just dominating. Red Auerbeck Celtics just uh, owned the 60s, and Jerry West, was he wasn't wearing that Celtics jersey. If only he could have flipped... But he had pretty a good amount of success, I'd say, as a player. So much so he was called Mr. Clutch. And the NBA made a logo that looked like him. He's basically the logo. So that's you have to think that's a, a some sort of success, right? But like I said, my man played in nine NBA finals. Nine finals. And they won one title, which is pretty crazy. And it wasn't against the Celtics, which is even crazier. He did win the 1969 NBA Finals MVP award, even though they lost. They didn't even win that year, and he won the Finals MVP, which is pretty amazing. And Bill Russell is a big Jerry West fan. I always loved Jerry West. He's, he's a big fan, and vice versa. He was instrumental putting together those championship teams that played in the 2000s. He traded uh, to get the Kobe Bryant draft pick in 1996. He signed Shaquille O'Neal away from my Orlando. Magic. Can you believe this guy? Anyways, put such a great team together. And he was actually instrumental in a lot of the 80s Lakers stuff that went on, uh, even though Pat Riley was the coach at that time. But Jerry West was a uh, part of that organization and did a lot for it. 
then either. All right, number five, we move on to the big O, Oscar Robertson. We already talked about him because he played with Lou Alcindor with the Milwaukee Bucks, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So the big O, uh, he was pretty amazing in college with Cincinnati. He led the nation in scoring a, a few times. And in the NBA, he, along with Russell Westbrook, are the only players to ever have averaged a triple-double during an entire NBA season. So he actually did it a few times, as did uh, Russell Westbrook. It's interesting that Robertson was the only player to have done it. He did this in the 60s, and for decades, no one had done it until Russell Westbrook finally did do it again in the 20-teens. But uh, Big O was the original triple-double guy. He was the original guy that averaged it. So that's impressive from that perspective. Number six, Pistol, Pete Maravich. Now, this guy was awesome to watch. Just a great ball handler, a great shooter, an inventive player. Like, he was just, uh, he was a wizard. Like, he was just amazing with the basketball. But he played in the 70s. His rookie card was, unfortunately, one of the 1970-71 Cops tall boy cards, which are, they're not, they're, they're kind of tough to get in good condition because, they're tall boys, and when people put them in their boxes, they'd always get bumped and banged and bent and all that, all the stuff that starts with bees. And uh, so they're not that. But his 1972 Tops card, which is one I love, with the gold background and the, and the pink lettering on the, his Atlanta Hawks team name, it's a gorgeous card, and he's doing the dribble on the three, between his legs. So it's a pretty cool looking card of Pistol Pete. He's got the long hair waving through his little Justin Bieber thing going on, but he played in the 70s. What that means is basketball in the 70s was not great. It was diluted. You had two professional teams stealing talent from each other. It wasn't a lot of cohesion, and you had a lot of drugs running rampant. It was a tough time to be a professional NBA player, and so he kind of he wasn't as great of a superstar as he probably should have uh, been remembered as. Now, he was the... Division one men's basketball, college basketball scoring leader ever. Um, and that's so that's kind of impressive. Uh, so in the end, Pistol Pete, Dr. J, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, like those are the three best bets for 1970s collectability. Those three guys are the best guys from that era. Number seven, now we move into the back end of this. John Havlicek of the Boston Celtics got one of some titles with the with the with the C's back then, he was Hondo. He had the big nickname, awesome nickname. He ended up playing such a big role as a player off the bench that the NBA named the Sixth Man Award after John Havlicek. That's a pretty cool uh, story, right? Now, here's the problem with John Havlicek. His rookie season was 1962. So that means he missed out on the 1961 Fleer set. So his rookie card comes in 1969 tops which means it was like his seventh or eighth season i can't do math i don't know but that's pretty crazy right that that took that long for him to get his rookie so kind of like isaiah thomas his rookie card ended up being so much later than when he came out in the nba when the 86 Fleer set came out but uh havlicek is a great player to own and let me just throw this little nugget in there if you're a cleveland browns fan Havlicek is a nice card to own because he played in camp with the Cleveland Browns in 1962. The Browns drafted him, brought him into camp, and uh, he competed a little bit as a wide receiver. And then he had eventually decided to bail on his football dreams and go play in the NBA for the Boston Celtics. We move on to number eight, another Lakers player, if you can believe it. Of course you can believe it. Lakers are pretty amazing. Elgin Baylor, one of the greatest small forwards in NBA history. Now, you don't hear a lot about Elgin Baylor uh, from a collectability standpoint, certainly, but just in the NBA in general because he was the third star on a superstar-laden team. I mean, he, Wilt Chamberlain and Jerry West and then Elgin Baylor also. So I kind of liken it to James Worthy on the 80s Lakers teams. James Worthy with Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. James Worthy was kind of... The third guy, even though he was the youngest of the three and absolutely uh, phenomenally talented, just like Baylor, he was kind of the quieter, forgotten guy among those trio of superstars. So I thought that was pretty cool. Now, what's interesting also about Baylor is he really only has four cards to collect from. Or as I mentioned with John Havlicek, the timing of when he came in 
was a little tricky. He was an 11-time NBA All-Star, but he started his career in 1958. That means he missed out on that 1957 top set. His rookie card was the 1961 Fleer set, but then his second card didn't come for another seven or eight years. This was the 1969 top set. He played a couple more years. In 1970, Elgin Baylor tore his Achilles tendon. And so after just two games into that season, tried to come back in the following season, that 1971 season, played just nine games, but he was a shell of himself. And he said, you know what, if I'm not going to be uh, helpful to the team, I'm just going to retire. So he retired after just nine games in that season. They went on to win the championship that year. He, was, he wasn't on the championship. Chamberlain and West, but no Baylor, and they win the championship. So that's kind of a crazy story, but really just about four cards that are collectible uh, for Elgin Baylor. That 61 Fleer rookie card, and then 1969, 1970, 1971 tops cards. All right, number nine. We talk about L.A. a lot. We're talking about Boston a lot. How about we talk about both of those combined? Bill Walton. He played for UCLA, won some titles with the Bruins, and, and John Wooden, head coach John Wooden, he's the one that came after Lou Alcindor, gets drafted number one overall by the Portland Trailblazers. Foot injuries. Foot injuries really did haunt Bill Walton throughout his career and really kind of derailed his, his NBA career. He ended up, he was an impressive player throughout, but he just was hampered by the injuries. This is something to make us think about, remain a little cautious with someone like Chet Holmgren, who's already had a broken foot uh, when he got after he got drafted. So maybe don't go crazy on Chet Holmgren cards, but who knows? He could be healthy from here on out. It looks fantastic, obviously, in his second year slash his rookie year. But uh, back to Bill Walton. This guy was an impressive guy, and what's cool is he turned into a great NBA commentator on TV. He was amazing. So that kind of has helped his collectability. We've seen that in other sports and in the NBA. Players that go into uh, broadcasting help you know, their Q rating, so to speak. They, it helps their profile, which ends up helping their collectability uh, from our perspective. Number 10, we finally get to a New York player. This is Walt Frazier. For the New York Knicks. Now, when you lead a team from New York to two titles, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to be very collectible in any hobby. So that's what Walt Frazier did. Uh, two titles with the Knicks. You know, he's the greatest, one considered one of the greatest Knicks ever. Patrick Ewing's there, but I mean, Walt Frazier won two NBA titles. If Patrick Ewing had won two titles before Michael Jordan went on his sixth championship run uh, string in the 90s. If Ewing had gotten two titles before that, he would be the second most collectible player in the 86 Fleer set. Uh, his rookie card would be the second most valuable or most collectible as opposed to, he's like fourth or fifth now behind like Lajuan and Barkley. So really, those championships that Walt Frazier got brought his collectability level up greatly. He was nicknamed Clyde. Clyde Frazier. They nicknamed him Clyde because my man was stylish. He had the drip. I don't know what the drip is, but that's what the kids tell me. He had the drip going. He looked good. He named Clyde because he was stylish like Bonnie and Clyde, like Warren Beatty from the movie Bonnie and Clyde, which came out in the 70s, I think. 60s, 70s, somewhere around there. But that's why he was nicknamed Clyde. Number 11, we'll move on to George Gervin. Iceman. San Antonio Spurs. He played from 1974 uh, through 1986. Now, Gervin's interesting because his rookie card came the same year as Bill Walton at 1974 top set. Two representatives on this dandy dozen uh, vintage basketball list, which makes that set pretty important, even though those cards were pretty ugly. They were not pretty looking cards. Pretty ugly, just not pretty pretty. Make sense? So, George Gervin is nicknamed Iceman because my man was so cool on the court. So, you gotta think that that makes sense. One of the greatest scorers in NBA history at the the finger roll, legendary finger roll. Now, what's interesting about George Gervin, at least what I thought, is he played with Dr. J and the Virginia Squires initially in the ABA, and then eventually he finished his career on the 1986 Bulls. Michael Jordan. He played with Dr. J and Michael Jordan. That's pretty good. Uh, Iceman. That was impressive. I, I, I like that. Uh, he's one of just four players in the NBA 
to average 30 points per game while shooting 50% from the field along with Michael Jordan, Steph Curry, and Shea Gilgis Alexander. Number 12 on our list is Elvin Hayes. Now, this was a, a interesting spot because he didn't have a ton of cards because his, his playing career bookended uh, when Topps started in 1969 and then when Topps stopped producing cards in 1981. He ranks among the greatest power forwards in NBA history. And when he was in college, his Houston Cougars ended UCLA's 47-game Win streak. There's a documentary about that, I believe. It's pretty interesting. You can check that out. But he did play from 1968 through 1984. So both sides of his career, he was missing cards on because he played uh, in an era when cards weren't produced on both sides, but then were only produced in the middle of his career. Um, here's a weird stat for you. Elvin Hayes retired as the NBA's all-time leader in minutes played. 50,000. Exactly. 50,000 minutes played. I, did he just, he got to 50,000 and he bailed? It was like the first quarter of some important game. It's kind of weird. I, I, I'm wondering what the what the reasoning is behind how that happened. But he's seventh all time in minutes played now behind a bunch of superstars like Dirk and Kevin Garnett and Karl Malone, LeBron. But at the time, he was the leader when he retired. All right, so some great NBA players whose cards did not make this dandy dozen list for whatever reason, guys like Nate Archibald and Rick Barry and Bill Bradley, uh, Billy Cunningham, Gail Goodrich, Connie Hawkins, Phil Jackson, the Bulls, 72, rookie card, Jerry Lucas, Moses Malone, who I mentioned earlier, Bob McAdoo, Earl Monroe, Calvin Murphy, Willis Reed, Pat Riley, Wes Unseld, and Len Wilkins. Now, all of those are great cards to get. I'm not saying you shouldn't get those cards. They're pretty great players, pretty great cards but they just didn't make the Danny Dozen, the top 12 vintage NBA cards that you should try to uh, put in your collection. So now be prepared for me to come through with the next set, the NBA modern, the Danny Dozen modern NBA cards. Now that's going to go from, from 1980 all the way through to 1999. Now you can start putting that list together yourself, so stay tuned for that one. We'll be doing that soon. But I did promise you, some Dr. J trivia nuggets. So I'm not going to leave you hanging. So here's three things I think you'll think were super interesting. You're glad you stuck around. The first thing, the Milwaukee Bucks actually drafted Dr. J when he became draft eligible in 1972, which means he also, he almost became a Bucks teammate with Oscar Robertson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. That's pretty amazing. They're just two years removed from a championship. Now, the reason it had to be when he was draft eligible as the NBA did not draft players that uh, were not draft eligible, which means they were not underclassmen. So the ABA was like, we don't care. It was a hardship case that invented that whole thing. So the Dr. J went and played for the ABA, but in the NBA, his first rights went to the Milwaukee Bucks. I thought that was pretty cool. Also interesting is Dr. J signed a contract with the Atlanta Hawks in 1972, right before the 1972 NBA draft. So he signed a contract and actually played three exhibition games with those Hawks and Pete Maravich. They were on the same team for a minute. The Atlanta Hawks, how much would that have changed everything? But a judge finally decreed that Irving would have to play for the Virginia Squires in the ABA who held his professional rights already. And then the Bucks drafted him in the 1972 draft. What's going on? Number three, this one's pretty crazy. So the Virginia Squires eventually became the New York Nets the, that next season. And they, uh, after the 1975-76 NBA season, they merged. Those ABA and NBA merged. And only four teams made it over from the ABA. The Denver Nuggets, the San Antonio Spurs, the Indiana Pacers, and the New York Nets. However... Because the New York Nets infringed on the New York Knicks territory, they would have to pay the Knicks $4.8 million just to join the NBA. That was like their fine for infringing on the Knicks territory. So they owed the Knicks $4.8 million. The Nets said, i tell you what, that's a, that's a big chunk of money. How about we just give you Dr. J? Instead of the cash, Dr. J, we move into the, the area and all is good. The Knicks said, um, Dr. J, championship, why would we want that? They said, no, 
They refused that trade. They took the cash instead. Pretty dumb move. And the Knicks are still looking for uh, another title ever since four or five decades ago. So there you have it. That's our dandy dozen vintage NBA uh, video. What do you think about it? Let me know in the comments. Do you think someone was rated too low? Do you think someone was maybe up too high? Should I have more centers? Should I have less centers? Let me know in the comments and uh, get ready for our next dandy dozen modern set coming up pretty soon. Whatever you do, make sure you have a happy hobby.